Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning if you're in California, uh, Blogging Theology. My name is Paul Williams, and today we have a, a very special, distinguished scholar, Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali. You're most welcome to Blogging Theology, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, uh, Dr. Ali has been on Blogging Theology before, of course, And uh, but I will just briefly mention uh, who he is, according to the Zaytuna College uh, website, where he teaches. Uh, he is a scholar of uh, Islamic law, and his research interests include the interconnection between law and identity formation, comparative Islamic law, and Islam's role in the modern world. And at, in, at Zaytuna Institute, or college rather, in California, Dr. Ali teaches jurisprudential principles, family law, inheritance law, commercial law, prophetic tradition, creedal theology and Islamic virtue ethics. And Dr. Ali got his PhD uh, from the Graduate Theological Union in 2016. Um, and uh, he has written uh, a, a great uh, a great deal, actually. And you can see some of his work uh, in the, uh, the Lamppost uh, Education Institute, um, where there's an article, a particular article, we're going to discuss the issues arising from the article. It's called The Homosexual Challenge to Muslim Ethics. The Homosexual Challenge to Muslim Ethics. You can just Google that uh, or you can go straight to uh, the Lamppost Education Initiative website. And um, uh, it's a very um, erudite, I think, uh, and balanced um, and moderate, if that's the right word, uh, treatment of the subject, which is really forefront in many activists' minds in the West when it comes to establishing the normalcy and the acceptability of behaviours which Islamically are, are not accepted. Um, but, um, Dr. Ali, can I just ask, first of all, why you wrote this article and mm -hmm. perhaps give a, a, an overview of, of what it's about for us? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that question. And uh, there's a an interesting backstory to um, hmm. the publication or let's say the posting of that particular article. Um, I started studying at the Graduate Theological Union in 2009, in the spring of 2009. And I was working on my, master, my master's degree in ethics and social theory. Um, I took a particular course at one of the seminaries um, and um, this particular class had um, multiple um, people who uh, we would say belong to the uh, the far left, right? Um, and um, and there were some in the class who uh, they were had an association, claiming an association with Islam, although I think for most mainstream Muslims would really be very skeptical about their commitment and conviction to Islam. And, um, and one of our assignments, um, uh, we had, um, well, not just one, but the, for the semester, we had an obligation to interact with one another on an online uh, platform. And, uh, and one particular uh, post by one individual was that uh, Islam uh, endorsed, uh, endorses homosexual acts and that, you know, that there were people who are arguing that it was OK uh, for, for these, that there was nothing problematic about it. And, and I challenged this particular question, uh, well, this, well, this assertion. Uh, and the particular student started to post um, some quotes from certain people who they um, considered to be authoritative uh, um, in the Islamic um, area of Islamic law and, and others, and uh, people who most people wouldn't know anything uh, about or never heard from. Uh, and I told them, I told her that um, that realistically, that you know, nobody would actually um, consider any of these people to be authorities, and and it's very clear from the Quran. Um, that there's no basis for this. Now, this particular individual, although claiming to, to be a Muslim, also identified as a lesbian. Um, uh, and, um, and so we started to have a back and forth. And at a certain point, she shut down. And I continued, of course, I was, wasn't as sensitive as I probably should have been uh, to, uh, to, to her situation because uh, I didn't realize at first, okay, her shutting down or her not responding anymore probably has something to do with her feeling attacked right you know by me you know and so naturally mm -hmm. when you come to accept that okay I'm, I'm a muslim and this is okay to be the way that i am based upon your uh belief that muslim scholars uh are okay with this right? and so you start to feel attacked so eventually this led to a 
larger uh, class um, uh, discussion, right, because of this exchange. And I gave uh, students an opportunity to sort of cri criticize me and to attack me. And, and of course, I responded, right? But, um, but you know, of course, the claims, uh, I, was, I was being badgered or painted as the intolerant one, you know, and I had to highlight to them that, you know, I think that you're very, very intolerant as well, right? So, you know, you call me judgmental. I, I'm, you know, I think you're very judgmental too. At any rate, um, I, I completed my degree, uh, and then I, st I, I um, started the PhD program. And so during the PhD program, because of this particular incident, um, it, the, the, the story of uh, or the topic of homosexuality in particular was uh, something weighing heavily on me because um, up until that point, it had never been a major issue or point of discussion in the Muslim community yeah. nationally in the West, right? So, uh, so one particular course I took was entitled uh, Anthropology and Ethics. Uh, and it was led by two um, um, graduate students, uh, a male and a female, they were Catholics. Uh, and, um, and basically we had a, um, a uh, final paper and I chose to write about this topic from a Catholic perspective. Right. You know, actually, I studied we went into um, Thomas Aquinas and actually one of the early courses I took during my MA was in Catholic moral theology or moral theology from a, a Thomistic perspective. Right. So I had the original article didn't include any references to, to Islam. Right. So oh, yeah. um, interesting. So here, here were you, a Muslim scholar writing, uh, uh, articulating the position from St. Thomas Aquinas, who is a. Uh, probably the most preeminent Roman Catholic theologian in the medieval period, if not of all time. Right. And I, just, yeah. I just find the, well, it's not ironic. Well, it is ironic in a sense, but his, but his, what well, I understand, it, Tom, Thomism is the, the, the name of the school of thought that comes out of Thomas, Thomism, mm -hmm. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he was a, around, alive um, uh, about the time that Ibn Timur was alive, funnily enough. Right. And, and he, chronologically, mm -hmm. obviously, they don't think he ever had tea together, but, um, mm -hmm. but, um, but um, I, I've always been struck by his, his theology, his understanding of ethics and mm -hmm. what they call virtue ethics. This is the mm -hmm. modern expression of Thomist ethics. Right. Uh, so people like Alistair McIntyre, this British mm -hmm. professor who's now in, in, in America for years. Uh, for some right. mm -hmm. but, whatever. Um, but how similar uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the way uh, it's expressed is to uh, many uh, ways of expressing it in Islam in terms of the uh, mm -hmm. emphasis on what Catholics call natural law, right. uh, the, the way uh, we are constituted as human beings in uh -huh. a particular way, male and female, and the complementarity, right. and and so I don't want to take away your point here, but uh, I was mm -hmm. just struck by that, that there are many parallels between the Catholic traditional Catholic yes. understanding and the Islamic uh, understanding throughout history. Right. Well, yeah, I think that there's there's one two major reasons for that for the overlap is one is because we share. Um, you know, prophets, right? That we are part of, part of a continuum of divine um, intervention into human um, societies. And so they call the Abrahamic traditions, uh, you know, so naturally there's gonna be overlap in morality from between Muslims and Catholics and, and, and other like Jews uh, as well, uh, as well as Protestants. Uh, but the other reason I would say is because we share a, um, a uh, you know, we share in our mutual benefit uh, from the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, um, and, um, and in particular Aristotle, uh, also Plato, but I think more so uh, Aristotle has probably had a larger influence on yeah. um, Muslim theologians, at least mainstream theologians, than uh, than, than Plato, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah. You know, but um, I think that those two reasons are, are, are sufficient uh, for us to to you know, see a lot of overlap in that uh, that much of um, uh, what we see shared uh, between the two traditions uh, uh, is, is, is significant, pretty significant in the moral realm, right? Yeah. So, right. So, so basically, what happened is, like I said, so I, I took this course and I wrote my paper. It was focused on the Catholic tradition. At the end of that particular course, we were asked the students to share our our papers with one another. Um, of course, unbeknownst to me, there was actually one student who was hypersensitive who I suspect actually was gay. He was from a different country. He wasn't from the U.S. Uh, so he had some very negative comments, comments to <laughs> comments about my particular paper. 
uh, and also went ahead and attacked the Prophet Muhammad because of that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, at any rate, you know, the the teachers, the uh, the students who are in charge, the graduate students who are in charge, they told me that his comments weren't going to have any impact on my grade. Uh, and actually, they told me that I was very brave to actually even those to delve into the topic itself. Right. So so basically, once I had finished uh, that course and then later on to my PhD, I felt uh, that it was important to actually uh, actually, you know, actually I hadn't finished my PhD yet before I actually uh, added the Islamic material to this particular article, uh, because this article, when you read it, you can tell that it actually uh, emerged prior to the Supreme Court uh, ruling um, um, legalizing gay marriage, which was in 2000, 2015. Right. So I wrote it prior to 2015 and posted yeah. it. And at the time, the Muslim community really were they were very nervous about the topic. They didn't really want to publicly speak about it either for or against, you know, but we've come, we've come a, a long way since then. Right. You know, and I think at the time, uh, I'm relatively certain that my article probably was the only one that was available. Right. Uh, from an Islamic yeah. perspective at the time, you know, since then, many right. have been written. So I didn't realize you you're you're a pioneer and your and your your work is seminal. Um, and so I I do recommend the article. I'll link to it in the uh, description below, as well as and a couple couple of other articles as well, which I'll come to uh, perhaps later. So in a nutshell, um, Dr. Ali, what is now and perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, we've come some way since the Supreme Court ruling on gay marriage. But what now is the homosexual challenge to Muslim ethics, as you entitle your essay that you just referred to? Yeah, well, the the essay itself uh, wanted to I, I sought to examine certain scientific theories about the question of whether or not an individual can be born gay, uh, because that's what what the cry was at the time from the uh, LGBTQ community, um, if we can call it a community, because that in itself is its own conversation by itself. Yeah. But, sure. but basically, um, uh, I, I was curious to say, well, what if, what if someone actually is can be scientifically mm. proven to have been born gay? Uh, what particular effect would that have on Muslim um, morality, uh, um, and how would it? Uh, would it demand from us uh, to make major adjustments, uh, uh, or would we continue uh, on the same path and and basically try uh, work not to accommodate uh, individuals in that particular regard? Now, I listed multiple theories that that uh, you know which which uh, exist that were very popular at the time, and um, and and and, um, and fundamentally, uh, what. What what I I concluded at the end of it was that although two of the theories that I showcase one with relationship to hermaphroditism or pseudo hermaphroditism uh, and the other with relationship to uh, hormonal or androgen testosterone levels in fetal in the fetal uh, phase of of, of the of the uh, of the child's development uh, that uh, all the other scientific theories seem to be completely baseless. Um, and actually, since then, in 2016, uh, John, John Hopkins University actually um, uh, released a, a study uh, in a journal, um, um, in a, in a journal uh, of which was related to homosexuality. And they concluded that there is no scientific basis, right, for the claim that once some person is born gay, or or transgender, right? As well, right? Actually, this is you know, and there was a big uproar in 2016 because Wait, of. Just to clarify that. So you're saying that John Hopkins' research showed yeah. that there was no, basically, there's no biological or genetic uh, origin or cause of uh, this of homosexuality. Is that is that right? right. So, yeah. Well, basically, the, the, again, they're not saying that the science is necessarily conclusive. They're just saying based upon the current hypotheses, which have been yeah. studied and looked at very closely, that none of them hold any sway. None of them hold any, uh, not, so any claim of a person being born. Gene, not, the idea of a gay gene, for example, this kind of media um, trope is simply non-existent in terms of actual scientific research. There's, no one's discovered in the DNA somewhere a gay gene as such. Right, exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. So they said that, that, of course, that's one of the theories is a gay gene, one theory, uh, of course, that uh, uh, 
uh, you know, all of that. Some some say it was is reincarnation. Some uh, say it's because of 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 um, of of course the hermaphrodite is a person's born with both um, uh, genitalia, for instance, and it may turn out that we assume that the individual belongs to the wrong sex. Uh, another is that um, that brains in the uh, when when children are uh, in their mother's womb as they develop at a certain point, uh, when the hormones start to be um, transferred to them from their mothers, right? If it's a male child, then it should have more of one particular type of hormone as opposed to another. And if it doesn't get enough of that, then the brain can uh, turn out to be under masculinized or masculinated and vice versa, right? With regard to female children. So, and they say that because of that, there is the, um, there's some evidence that once they enter puberty, that individuals um, who have that, those conditions potentially uh, could, um, could develop attraction for the same sex, right? Uh, uh, the Johns Hopkins study actually goes a little further and actually says that uh, sexuality or sexual orientation, you know, those, he said the term's not even scientific to begin with, right? You know, it's mm. uh, that sex, sexuality or sexual attraction, because uh, they're, you know, multiple terms they use, uh, they're very nebulous terms to begin with. And, and they say that, um, that fundamentally, it's hard to make the claim that, um, that your sexuality is particular, uh, oriented in one particular direction, right? Yeah, throughout your life, right? Because developmental and a lot of different factors can contribute to you uh, having, uh, of course, more attraction to one sex than the other, you know, some but perhaps totally uh, attracted to the uh, to one sex. Uh, but many people will have um, a, a bit more um, uh, dynamism involved in their sexual um, uh, attraction, right? You know, and, 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 and then it depends on how we actually uh, define those terms, right? So, um, so it's really, um, it's, it's it, we know it's a minefield, you know, especially today, right? You know, to even have this conversation, and I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, if YouTube will even censor your video, but um, we, we try our best to. I can certainly uh, protest if they decide to uh, yeah. uh, censor it. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Islamically, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you're the scholar and I'm not, but correct me if I'm wrong. Islamically, for example, the Sharia, the Islamic law, mm -hmm. it seems to be concerned with behavior, actions, mm -hmm. rather than feelings or private thoughts, or even private actions in terms mm -hmm. of when it comes to the morality of sexual behavior, I mean. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also that when it comes to the Hadood punishments or punishments mm -hmm. for um, act. So the, the, the main focus of the Sharia, uh, mm -hmm. that I, I understand it historically, is something called liwat. Uh, mm -hmm. right. but, you know, that is the word, it's called liwat, which it can be translated as sodomy, which is basically mm -hmm. the insertion of the male member into an, another yeah. person's backside. I don't, I don't yeah. put this lightly, really, because it's just that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that seems to be the uh, the most egregious um, action, uh, Sharia-wise, although mm -hmm. other forms of same-sex uh, actions are uh, sexual activity, I should say, are also prohibited. But the, the catch is when it's done publicly, you know, you had it like, mm -hmm. like adultery or fornication, yes. zina. Uh, so it's not really just a, a gay thing. This is like any action which takes mm -hmm. place publicly, uh, whether it be liwat or adultery or fornication, zina, whatever, is punishable. But even then, there have to be four upstanding male right. witnesses usually right. to the act who then have to agree to go to court to testify that they had seen this action mm -hmm. uh, right. and it's a very specific action they have to see without going becoming too graphic it's not like mm -hmm. they vaguely saw two guys doing stuff no they have to have witnessed actual penetration and the same mm -hmm. for adultery of course between men and, men and women as well mm -hmm. um uh, the, the, the other uh, avenue to prosecution or punishment, I should say, would be if someone voluntarily self-incriminates. So, uh, yeah. you know, Mr. So-and-so goes to court and says on four occasions, perhaps four separate occasions, depending on the mm -hmm. legal score, right. well, I did X, I did X, I did X, mm -hmm. I, I did X. That, that counts as, you know, the four witnesses in one guy and he's the guy that did it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But even then, you're supposed to ward off these who, who do punishments. Right. Uh, in case you know but that but it, it's not like you know oh i'm gay therefore i must be punished which is kind of you get yeah. the stereotype in western 
understandings of Islamic law. It's mm -hmm. very, uh, I mean, that's a very crude summary, but is there anything that I've said that, that's completely off, off mark in terms of? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I think I'll probably just add a, a, a couple of things. Um, na na yeah, naturally, um, Islam criminalizes all forms of illicit intercourse, you know, fornication, adultery, um, and of course, sodomy. No, sodomy is treated uh, unequally to the others because of the, or at least is, you know, is, is, is rationalized in such a way or is reason that it has a lot to do with the fact that sodomy in particular, or this same sex interaction, tributism, for instance, that these uh, commitments that they cut off the um, the act from the possibility of procreation, right? Um, and um, so adultery is seriously bad. You know, the fornication is less serious than that, but um, homosexual interaction or sex is is considered to be worse uh, um, and actually considered to be unnatural. Uh, and um, and so for that reason. Um, we do find uh, punishments or crimes uh, or punishment for these, you know, they're just considered to be crimes which are punishable by Islamic law. Uh, they're sins as well, right, as we know. So not just crime, but a sin and punishable by Islamic law. Of course, the scholars don't agree upon what the actual punishments are for sodomy, for instance. Um, uh, some say that the uh, punishment is to be flogged a hundred times and similar to a person commits fornication. Uh, one, some say that the person should be stoned to death as, as one would do for an adulterer. Um, you have extreme examples or uh, uh, punishments such as uh, burning people alive, which is extreme minority uh, you might find coming from uh, some Shi'i um, um, circles. Uh, and then you have uh, things like tossing someone off of, of a tower uh, and then uh, stoning them. Uh, and this is attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa, even uh, the the the, um, the, uh, uh, the founder of the, the Hanafi school. Um, so, so you do have these, you know. And so the basic concern is, as you highlighted, is uh, public indecency, right? You know, so sexual indecency, sexual uh, sexual um, um, deviance, and public indecency. And for that very reason, when it talks about there being four witnesses. It doesn't say only four witnesses. It actually stipulates it be four male upright witnesses, right? right. And, and, and that in itself reinforces uh, the belief and understanding that this is something that is so public that it cannot be ignored, right? And so, the, so if it's not done in such a public, public fashion, then the only other way that the person is incriminated is through confession, right? And we do have examples of this from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, but the punishment itself was viewed by the companions clearly as a as a form of 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 of, of uh, penance, I guess you would say. It was sort of a way to purge themselves of the sin, so that they don't meet God uh, uh, with the sin uh, on them, and then they'd be punished uh, uh, again. Right. So that was. And for this very reason, we find the prophet discouraging people from coming one for one confessing openly about their sin that they do secretly. Uh, then, and then also um, that he discouraged people who came admitting that they committed adultery, right? You know, but eventually, uh, those who insisted, he granted them their purification uh, once he 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 gleaned that there was true sincerity in those people. Yeah, that they weren't insane or children or, or otherwise incapacitated or disqualified. And there are various, right. yeah. So, so, I mean, it strikes me as how extremely unlikely or virtually impossible it is right. uh, for these kind of public acts of yeah. adultery or, or uh, liwat, sodomy, to be mm -hmm. proven in a court because, mm -hmm. you, you know, you have to have a, a number of people watching it. You know, what are they yeah. doing watching it anyway? And they have to, you know, and, and it has to be a very specific act. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, why are you doing it in public anyway? I mean, you know, yeah. get a room, you know, sort of thing. But, you know, it's right. a, very un, a very unlikely scenario right. anyway. So it's right. right. Unless, of course, you're, you're, as you say, voluntarily, voluntarily right. confessing it. So Right. And, and then the other part, I was, as I had, you're also not, you're not supposed to accuse someone of right. doing it if you suspect that they, they've done it. And even if you actually witness them do it, you have to make sure that all of your witnesses there um, 
they actually going to going to going to confess in and in, in admit to seeing exact same exact thing that you saw, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, this actually is something that happened during the reign of Umar ibn Khattab, where the companion Mughira ibn Shu'aba uh, uh, was accused of of committing uh, illicit intercourse, you know, with a woman, and Abu Bakr, who was um, uh, not Abu Bakr Siddiq, but Abu Bakr was a, another companion who accepted Islam uh, after the conquest of Mecca. Uh, and Abu Bakr, he accused Mughira of, of, of this. But he also had witnesses. So two of his witnesses admitted or also confessed. You know, that, yeah, we saw him on top of this woman and he was doing what a man would do with a woman. Uh, and then, but his brother, Abu Bakr's brother, said, well, I saw something. I saw his, of course, his backside and I saw some movement, but I didn't really see any penetration myself. No. And because of that, <laughs> Mugira wasn't punished, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. three is not four. Three witnesses is not right. enough. You need four. Right. And then right. they need to go to court and actually say the right, right thing and not just, oh, I just saw a bit of whatever. You've got to have right. seen it. So and, then, and then if you can if you can prove your case, you get punished. You get flogged you get three times, right? So it's quite a deterrent. So the whole thing is, right. uh, it's, it seems more like a deterrence, you know, a right. public statement of the egregiousness of the behavior, right. the unacceptability of the public indecency, rather than a serious bit of legal control where people routinely get stopped and arrested right. and charged. So that's that, that doesn't seem to be what happens or could happen in right. practice at all. Right. So, so I mean, it's well, it's well. I mean, it is the case that you know, places like the United States, France, Britain, Western Europe, all of Europe, Russia, you know, the, the Islamic law is not implemented and is not meant to be implemented. These are not Muslim societies, so the Hadoo punishments are not in operation. Muslims can't take the law into their own hands, if you like, and implement Hadoo. You need an Islamic society which is constituted in such a way where there is, you know, all sorts of laws in operation. And that's not the case in the West. So there's nothing to fear from anyone else, if you like, about Muslim right. attitudes to this, because it's not going to happen in the West. Uh, right. Obviously, there are countries where the Hindu punishments are, in theory or in practice, uh, uh, in operation, but there's certainly nowhere you know, in the West anyway. Right. So, yeah. I um, mean, this will fall under what we call the Akam Sultania, the... Um... The, the 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 rules that govern the sultan right the the yeah. in other words um the obligation to enforce them falls on the sultan or the state the head of state right that that you know and so if they're negligent then of course they're sinful if they you know uh, and then and then of course if they do enforce it then they definitely want to make sure that they're uh, applying it fairly right with everyone right so, so the homosexual challenge to Muslim ethics, the title of your essay, um, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't go into a great deal of detail. It does, does mention that, but it's mainly concerned with uh, mm -hmm. the nature-nurture debate and the mm -hmm. Catholic understanding of sexuality and natural law and so mm -hmm. on. But, but how serious uh, has been the challenge uh, from um, some Muslims who advocate the uh, a revisionist view, if I can call it that, uh, yeah. arguing the Quran doesn't actually condemn liwat sodomy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, ha has this? Has this? Uh, uh, there's a particular um, uh, writer, um, uh, Kugel, I think his name is. Um, yes. this, uh, Google. Scott Kugel, uh, mm -hmm. who I think is an Islamic scholar. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think he might be. And and he has written um, in a revisionist way, questioning whether or not uh, homosexual acts in Islam are indeed uh, haram at all. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know uh, there have been responses uh, to this. So what, one of the best ones is by a chap called uh, Mobin Vade, Mobin Vade, yeah. who uh, mm -hmm. wrote a brilliant uh, rebuttal of Scott Krugel's revisionism in right. an article called Can Islam Accommodate Homosexual Acts? Right. Right. And I'll link to this uh, in the description below. It's mm -hmm. a superb piece of uh, scholarship, uh, and um, it's cited by... Uh, many other uh, scholars like um, uh, got his name now um, uh, the, about the Islamic scholars as, as a go-to text to uh, have the issues <laughs> how much traction have these revisionist views um, have, do they have now do you think because in the Christian community in the Catholic Church, Anglican, Methodist whatever, mm -hmm. these revisionist theories are becoming increasingly popular and may even be mainstream yeah. now but is that happened in the, the Muslim community? Well, I, I think that um, my I put it like this. I can speak about anecdotal uh, evidence of of a rejection of the 
um, of the revisionist view. For one, I mean, for one, most people, most Muslims don't even know who Scott Kugel is. Right. He's, an, right. he's an academic. Um, and most Muslims you know, probably would never even know that a book uh, trying to validate homosexuality actually exists. Yeah. However, there are, of course, more popular um, uh, Muslims right, in the West, in the political realm, who themselves have endorsed at least, um, well, but endorsed, you know, the an attempt to, you know, to revise this. You know, you actually can find it. Um, uh, people like, um, um, uh, uh, boy, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, Keith, um, uh, the, the congressman, um, Keith Ellison, for instance, and in, in back in uh, I think about 2001, 2002, he had a video that he posted, and he was basically calling Muslims, you know, just get over it. You know, uh, you find people and popular um, uh, or, or popular in social media, and some of them in the media now. You know, there was a piece that was written some years ago by um, Hassan Minhaj and and um, Reza Eslan. You know, similarly coming out yes. telling Muslims, you know, just get over it. You know. Yeah, it is yeah. what it is, and you know you need to embrace it. Um, you, you have, of course, uh, Ilhan Omar and Nandis Sarsour and uh, Rashid Talib and others like that, similar who are between um, people who embrace transgender people, transgenderism as something apparently valid, uh, between embracing that and, and or at least just simply uh, not being critical of it for political mm -hmm. reasons. But the community overall, I would say that the, the mosque-going community, they don't accept these ideas, that they're not in favor uh, of, 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 of teaching their children that to be gay is okay, right? Um, and every time I've spoken publicly about this issue at Jumar or something like that, uh, that I found that, you know, the very receptive audiences, you know, to who actually, they're, they're in favor of Quranic teachings on this. Now, the, the idea <laughs> that the Quran says nothing about uh, about sodomy is really it was really ridiculous, and, you know. So and 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 Scott Kugel, I mean, all he needed to do was you know just read the the whole book one time, right? To to know that you know, unless he's simply just being um, uh, you know dismissive or disingenuous about what the Quran says on this issue. And every and so it's repeated. The story of of Lut or, or Lot is mentioned throughout the, throughout the Quran multiple times, and and it almost always it mentions it always mentions that this is uh, that you uh, uh, that you uh, prefer to approach men uh, lustfully and you abandon women, right? Um, and there's only one uh, reference that I can recall that actually adds something else. You know that okay that you also that you are uh, you 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 actually terrorize people on the road. That's actually that you that you stop people or you act as brigands or bandits on the road, right? So mm -hmm. so in addition to that, you know, so that's one verse. But every single verse includes mention of the issue of sodomy, you know, and this so it utilizes euphemism, euphemistic language. Uh, as the Quran utilizes, uh, as the Arabs in general did utilize for sex, you know, they there are multiple, many, many different euphemisms in the Arabic language for sex, right? And so the Quran follows that pattern as well. So it's mentioned uh, multiple times, and so it's very clear for anyone who's being who's objective and reasonable that the Quran um, that the Quran uh, condemns uh, sodomy, uh, that the Quran does not validate it. Uh, and that uh, that Allah, that God punished the people of Sodom uh, for for their these, this particular uh, act, you know, that they were doing. And of course, it's hadith as well. Uh, just to add to that, uh, which uh, say the same thing. Right. Exactly. Right. There. And the hadith can be a bit more explicit than that. You know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one hadith. Well, there are many narrations of it. You know, but it's of, of questionable authenticity. Even goes as far as saying that. And when anytime you find people doing the actions of the people of Lot, then you should kill the doer and the one who is done too, right? Mm -hmm. There's a question of authenticity, right? You know, but as I mentioned before, um, there's some scholars who say this hadith is sufficient uh, to for for this ruling to kill the uh, the, uh, the sodomite uh, or the individual who's actually found uh, or um, 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 you know, proven to to have been committed this, right? You know, that he's caught in the act, right? Or they're caught in the act. 
but then on the other hand, others say, well, uh, no, the hadith is not strong enough to actually uh, to to take such a harsh harsh uh, yeah. measure uh, towards these. It is the case that uh, the, the Islamic schools, the the four schools, if you like, of jurisprudence in Islam, Islamic law, uh, th there is no general agreement on the uh, the punishment for these the, these behaviors when they are detected and punished uh, it, uh, after the caveats we mentioned, the, the number of witnesses and blah, blah, blah. Um, so the, the, Han the Hanafi Madhab, uh, which is the most widely followed one in the world today, I believe, um, has no punishment, uh, no specified punishment. So you could have a Qadi, a judge saying, you know, give a verbal rebuke to the, uh, the offender or all the way up to death. But it's not specified, so it's, it's discretionary. Right. It seems for the right. Hanafi school, despite right. the hadith you mentioned, they have a particular understanding of, uh, of hadith and hadith, which we won't go into. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other schools, which like, perhaps the other three, which do have a, a, um, a harsher uh, mm -hmm. normative line in terms of the punishment. But there isn't right. agreement, as I'm trying to say, in, in yeah. amongst schools as to what the yeah. punishment would be anyway. And it could yeah. just be, as I say, as li a little, if that's the right word. Uh, as a verbal rebuke, uh, it, it needn't be anything harsher than that. Right. Yeah. There's 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 agreement that it is a sin. Is yeah. there's an agreement that is punishable. Right. But there's no agreement on what the punishment should be. Right. Yes. So that's just the way that yeah. it is. And so, so you know, ideas of stoning and so on is is you know that's the extreme end. But it, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that's that not there. But it it, it is not an agreed. Uh, punishment amongst all uh, all the mother right. uh, the Islamic right. And I'll just add something like about the Hanafi. You said, despite yeah. this, it is considered to be a very strong um, attribution to Imam Abu Hanifa that his opinion was that that uh, the the uh, the sodomite or the individual who's um, guilty or found guilty of committing mm -hmm. sodomy, that that individual should actually be taken up to a high place or a tower and tossed off, right? And then stone thereafter, right? And so, and so, and it said that his analogy, he was making a similar analogy on the actual story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. So yes. basically yes. he said, because God, God in the Quran, it says that that he overturned the city, he turned it upside down, right? You know, and so mm -hmm. it, it turned made, made its bottom its top, right? And it's in its top is bottom, and then rained down upon the city brimstone, right? So he says, Okay, well. Throw him off a tower, like God, you know, took the city up to the sky, according to the hadith that the angel Gabriel carried the cities on his wings and then uh, turned them over and then um, uh, thrust them or um, smashed them into the ground, and then uh, and then there those who were still remaining that they were uh, destroyed with the uh, remaining uh, brimstone that, that that came from the sky, mm -hmm. um, you know, but you know, so at any rate, you know, it's. Uh, as I stated, there's agreement that is sinful, there's agreement that is a crime punishable by Islamic law, but there's no agreement on what the punishment should be. No. Now, you mentioned uh, briefly earlier uh, the difficulty perhaps in even getting this uh, interview published on YouTube. Um, <laughs> is it the case, are we moving into a time in the West, not just the United States? I mean, YouTube is global, of course, although it is American, mm -hmm. where... Um, key Islamic teachings cannot be spoken of publicly for fear of punishment, retribution, censure, job loss, fines, uh, and so on. Uh, are, are we there yet? Are we approaching that time, do you think? Yeah, I think we're definitely approaching that time, if not already there, with regard to certain topics. Uh, and um, hopefully this gets a pass, right? Uh, but if it doesn't, then we'll know for certain <laughs> where we've arrived, right? So, um, and, uh, you know, but, but, um, there's definitely quite a bit of censorship and anyone who has eyes and they're working correctly can see it. Right. You know, so unless you're just simply in denial, right. That, that there's a lot of censorship. As a matter of fact, recently YouTube, YouTube decided that they're going to remove the, the dislike, um, feature from, from, from videos, right. Because their claims that, um, um, people who are um, creators and uh, they're being harassed by certain people and they're uh, putting the dislike button, uh, they're, they're putting more dislikes as opposed to likes and they want to protect their, their feelings from getting hurt. Um, you know, now some suspect that it has much more to do with the fact that the White House gets more dislikes <laughs> than likes on their videos, right? Uh, and similar, right? 
and similar videos uh, that are that are in favor of the establishment. Yeah. So, I mean, I, without getting, uh, I mean, you don't have to answer this question, but as they too know, college, for example, uh, are, are, are you and your colleagues able to teach the full range of Islamic subjects, eth ethics, morality, sexual, uh, or do you yes. are you obliged to self censor uh, because of California law or something? No, no, we're not obliged to self censor. Yeah, we, we teach, we teach it all, right? We teach it all. Right. So that's right. Right, and there's been there's no so that that's that still continues, and you're in you know the epicenter of political correctness in a way. You know you're in California, yeah, right. because, you know you, you've exported this to the rest of the world. Well, that's not entirely fair because France had a hand in this, I think. And right, that's right. France. In, 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 in philosophers like Foucault and others are making their hand, in, uh, yeah, in this as well. Um, okay, that's fine. So, um, so the, the homosexual change to Muslim ethics then is is not really at the level of successfully challenging the the structure of islamic law because right. it's very clear the hadiths are there the quran's there um and there's the the consensus of the ulama i take it globally on on this yeah. so the 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 challenge lies elsewhere um in terms of formation and and, and discussion of these issues in a very challenging environment for right. all of us but particularly for young muslim uh people who are, are trying to find out how they should live their lives pleasingly to God, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think that um, it's more of a, at this point, it's more of a sociopolitical challenge than a moral challenge because most of the, the Muslims who actually support, I guess you say, support civil rights for gays and others, that they'll, they actually say that, okay, yeah, no, no, I, I believe that Islam does not approve of this. But we live in a secular society, therefore, um, we have to respect people's rights to do whatever they want, right? And so, so in that sense, um, they feel the particular people who take this this perspective, they feel that they are they're safe by saying, okay, well, I'm not saying Islamically that it's okay, right? Uh, but I personally feel that you can't be um, not okay with it Islamically, but then okay with it politically either. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to go out and protest and uh, against gays and prevent them from getting certain certain rights, right? Uh, especially uh, right to, to to live and to um, to eat and things like that, right? But um, but fundamentally, I, I see no no distinction, right? You know, if you're against it morally, you're against it politically because political realm is moral realm as well. So the social realm is moral as well. But you you right? say that, Dr. Ali, but but, but uh, your, your Muslim colleagues, uh, I'm thinking of Professor Jonathan Brown, of course, famously right. in the United States, is a a Muslim academic. I mean, he teaches Islamic studies. He is a Muslim revert convert himself, right? Um, and he he accepts what you say in terms of the wrongness uh, of the actions in right. Sharia, but he's also advoca advocated that uh, Muslims in America should support the civil, the civil rights and mm -hmm. the rights to marry, gay marriage, and right. so on, but on a kind of quid pro quo basis of answering right. rights. Okay, well, well, not only support, support yeah. if you support yeah. our rights because yeah. we live in a secular space and mm -hmm. we don't agree with you, but we're going to support your right to have your thing, and therefore you can support our right to have our thing. Right. But he means that he is. He has signed up for the uh, this agenda, this LGBTQ agenda, right. but for kind of pragmatic reasons, not ideological right. reasons. But you, you wouldn't agree with that, clearly. No, no, I don't. And I publicly stated that I disagree with him. I privately stated to him, told him that I disagree with him about it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and he, he's taken it. He, he took it a step further some years ago. He had, he had a post on Yapin, I think, Yapin Institute's website, and and there's somewhat of a debate or back and forth between him and uh, Dr. Shadi mm -hmm. Masri on this particular okay. point. And and um, and he, he he argued that that Muslims should, at least my recollection is that he argued that Muslims not only should support their civil rights, but also be in alliance with them politically because. Muslims and gays are under attack from from the right, right? And so, so the right, the right sort of has been painted as the boogeyman for the community, you know. And so, they Muslims who are working with the left, they see uh, the right as 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 existential threat, and they'll say they'll say, okay, well, uh, well, how how can it not be when you have cases where these these right wingers have actually come and killed Muslims, right? In the Masajid, for instance. Uh, you know, in Canada it also happened, and I think it was in uh, Sydney or I forget the uh, the name of the uh, uh, 
the city, you know, and so so we say, okay, sure, yeah, all right, those are two examples, you know, but they're anecdotal, right, in the sense that you're not talking about a, a on a regular basis that this is something happening, right? You see, you know, so so, but you can understand why somebody can go can go that far. Uh, I, I I think that the uh, the 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 feeling or the uh, assumption that there's an existential threat, right? actually is misplaced, right? It's misplaced. Um, if anything, the existential threat, in my viewpoint, is from the left, not from the right. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say, I, I don't get this, uh, yeah. Dr. Ali. I really don't get this because the, the right, if I can, you know, the political right, the conservative mm -hmm. forces in the West, I mean, I think intellectually, I think of people like uh, Professor Roger Scruton, uh, who uh, sadly passed away recently, had a, a wonderful dialogue uh, with, with a colleague of yours, Zay Tuna. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, a very brilliant uh, professor of philosophy, a professor of aesthetics at Boston, a British professor um, who was conservative. But he, he, a lot of what he said is very compatible with Islam in terms mm -hmm. of gender, gender roles, understanding of sexuality, mm -hmm. the purpose of sexuality and so on. But you don't, you don't get – and he's demonized by the left, of course, but you don't get any of that on the left. The left is all about uh, the social construction of gender and, and uh, right. promoting mm – -hmm. Uh, highly uh, unusual alternatives, uh, shall we say. So right. it strikes me, homophobia, sorry, Islamophobia apart, and homophobia apart, I suppose, but Islamophobia apart, the right seems to be just as natural a, a place for um, the Republican right, even, uh, right. for Muslims to look for allies right. as the left. Uh, and of course, the left is very pro-Palestine, and the right is traditionally mm -hmm. Pro uh, Israel in America, anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit complicated, but I don't see right. a, an obvious alliance forming benefit with the left uh, right. a, a, against the right. I just don't get that. Yeah, well, I, again, I, I think it's um, it has a lot to do with the fact that the leadership in our community um, they operate or they seem to operate on the basis of sometimes popular sentiment and then perhaps even personal animus, which is the result of being attacked by people on the right, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, you get your feelings hurt. Somebody hurts your feelings, they call your name. Uh, so now I can't work with you anymore. And this is the same problem with uh, black Americans overall, right? And a lot of black people in different uh, Western countries as well is that we put feelings before interests, right? And, and if you're in a leadership position in my position that you can't allow the personal offense to dictate your reaction to people, right? Uh, uh, you have to have, you know, forbearance. You have to have composure. You have to be willing to accept, you know, criticism, right? Even, you know, so you say, okay, well, person, you, you have this criticism of me, but but you're wrong for this reason, that reason. But, you know, you, can't, you don't shut down and say, well, I'm not even going to have a conversation with those people because uh, they called us terrorists one time uh, or... Uh, they they were trying to um, ban the Sharia as if <laughs> as if they actually are concerned with actually trying to uh, mm. implement the Sharia right. In other words, um, many of the same people who are like would say that okay, we don't like the right because when 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 W. Bush George W. Bush was in office, he had all these efforts of a minority about you know three percent minority of Republicans according to their own research that actually were trying to pass anti Sharia legislation right. And it's like, okay, well, well, it doesn't look to me like you actually are concerned about the Sharia because the Sharia says that, you know, homosexual <laughs> uh, practices are haram, right? And but you're actually okay with them, right? Yeah, that you that you're not actually trying to um, inform society about the potential harms of that. You're you're not, uh, you know, I mean, because when I look at the agenda, it's okay. Well, you know, the agenda of Muslims is simply them parroting right, what the left gives to them. It's not anything independent. There's no leadership being shown. It's that mm -hmm. the Muslims are simply being shown, used as proxies for the left, and that's it, right, you know. Mm -hmm. But when we start talking about um, um, the ways that Islam is being harmed and the Muslim community has been harmed, there are many different ways, and in the most egregious way has been harmed, and that's through mm -hmm. the, uh, the deterioration of faith and conviction, right, you know, that there's at this point now fear that one or two generations from from now you may not have any more muslims right <laughs> you know and i think that 
they have to be, they have to take some blame for this, right? That there's a rise in atheism, a rise in uh, a rise in people who don't want to be affiliated affiliated with religion. You know, most of those ideas are being fostered by the left, right? Uh, exactly. The left is traditionally atheist. It's right. uh, heavily influenced by Marxism. Of course, Karl Marx, Lenin, Engels were atheists. Right. Uh, and and the right, particularly in America, is, is uh, I mean, you're better, than I, you know, better than I do, is 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 quite religious. It's, it's evangelical right. or Catholic or conservative, which is a natural, uh, despite issues of, you know, who is Jesus and whatever. But nevertheless, on the fundamental level of, of social order and morality and the Ten Commandments and so on, there's an incredible amount of overlap. Um, right. and, and yet they're seen as the enemy. So the Muslims mm -hmm. are in bed, so to speak, with the atheists right. uh, and are made uh, uh, over against the people who actually believe in God, who believe right. in the Ten Commandments, who believe in objective morality and marriage and so on. So right, it's yeah. so ironic uh, that these yeah. kind of weird relationships. Yeah, are, yeah. And the left has always been effective at this. And this is one thing uh, that, Mar that um, I'm sorry, Malcolm X had warned about. He warned about the, right. the left. And those, those warnings, I think, are still applicable today, right, about like, you know, the, them being the most dangerous, the, 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 we call it, he said the white liberal, for instance, is the most mm -hmm. dangerous um, person on the planet, right? Is that what he said? <laughs> right, exactly. So, so you have to yeah. be very careful about them, yeah. that, you know, because he said, he, he talked about the right and the left as a fox and a wolf, right? Uh, you know, but the, right. the right is like a wolf and the, 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 the lefty is like a fox, you know, so a, a wolf will come barking at you and you know, you're about to get hurt, right? You know, so you you can actually brace for it, you know. But the fox shows you his teeth, makes you think that he's smiling at you, but he's actually preparing for a meal, right? So, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Malcolm X came out came out with some amazing stuff sometimes, didn't he? Right. Exactly. Quite brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he also, and then one of his other profound insights related to the media, and not that he was the only one, you know, talked about the dangers of the media, you know, mm -hmm. but. And if you go, to, you know, my Twitter page, I have his, his statement about the media posted there. You know, oh, I, yeah. Folks, uh, follow Dr. Abdullah Ali on Twitter. Um, <laughs> he, he's not a patsy of the left. You can probably guess that anyway. But uh, uh, no, it, it's some fascinating content. So do, do seek him out on Twitter. So carry on. Yeah. So again, the, the statement about how, how the media itself is the most powerful entity on, on the planet. Right. And it can make the, the, the victim look, you know, make the... Uh, you know the victim look like uh, you know, victimizer and, vi and vice yeah. versa, right? Right, and um, they control the minds of the control the minds of the masses. Of course, I'm misquoting it, but but fundamentally, uh, it's through because of the fact that the media, the vast majority of the media in the West and perhaps even in the Muslim world now, you know, is really dominated by the left, right? Uh, the media, the academy, Hollywood, right? All those who control the imagery and the messaging are the ones who actually will uh, determine in the minds of people who actually observe um, uh, what reality is, right? You know, so, so our reality is mediated through these things, right? So, I mean, yeah. you can see it like come out in so many different ways. You know, like right now, everybody's debating about the Kyle Rittenhouse issue. Uh, and most of the people who actually are, who hate Kyle Rittenhouse haven't seen the evidence. They haven't, you know, watched the test testimony, you know, but they still have this negative viewpoint, a view yeah. of them, this young, young man. He right, didn't actually kill any, any, anyone. Uh, I think the people he killed were white, weren't they? I don't think he killed anyone who wasn't white. I mean, he didn't shoot. Right, exactly. Them. Yeah. Right. So there were two, uh, two uh, white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's just ironic because he's seen as someone who was killing blacks or something, but he didn't actually. To kill anyone or attack anyone who was who wasn't born. right. Right, he was defending himself. Right, it was a very clear case. Right, and even the um, the prosecutor and the witnesses for the prosecution uh, for the um, uh, uh, the, the government um, um, witnesses are very clear that they themselves have corroborated the claim that this is self defense. Right, you know. So, yeah. but again, people continue to run with what they think they know. Right, see, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's a lot of brainwashing that's happening, uh, and so so. Most of the time when I'm posting about things, I'm constantly trying to raise awareness about how the establishment is manipulating us and dividing us. Right. You know, so that's why I focus so much on the media, the media, the media. Right. And people have to understand that there are relationships. You know, you know, it's not just the media it's also Hollywood. It's also the academy. Is, is you understand? It's also the, the you know the law, federal law enforcement even sometimes you know the the government itself the military right yeah because yeah, mm -hmm. the military has contracts with you know major you know Twitter YouTube uh, um, 
um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these major big tech corporations as well, right? So, at any rate, you know, I don't want to go too far off the topic. I think, but I do think it's related. It's related to what we we're talking about, and and I do think that um, that it, what needs to be understood. Uh, in particular, when I speak about these issues about homosexuality and others, is that I'm not speaking from the standpoint of the person who hates like people who are gay or transgender and things like that. Um, uh, I'm concerned about it because I do believe that it is the um, probably the most important area of concern today in that all ethical systems are built upon a particular theory about the human being, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and so so fundamentally, what's happening today is that our definition of the human being is being changed. That there is yeah. an attempt to rewire our brains to think a certain way, right? And I have family members who are gay. I grew up with gay family members. Family members. I mean, my mother's sister. She's been a lesbian for decades. Uh, her son is bisexual. I had a gay cousin who died about seven eight years ago, right? So. I grew up around this, you know, so it's not as if, and when I see them, I hug them, they, you know, kids, I mean, this, we're, we're family, right? You know, so it's not as if, like, I'm not familiar with people who, who struggle with these problems. Uh, and and I do think that there are some people who, who realize that about me, and this is why in the past I've had people write me in private. You know, I remember there was a Muslim guy who wrote me and told me that, you know, I read your article and, and it really touched me. You know, I just want to let you know I never confessed this to you because he had been in contact with me for a number of years. And so he said, I used to be gay. I used to be in a relationship with men. And after I became Muslim, I continued to do these things, you know, but then I decided I'm going to try to now seek a relationship with a woman, right? However, certain members of the mosque are aware of my past. So every time I actually seen, I get close to actually start starting a relationship with a woman, uh, people will let her know, okay, about my past and then it gets broken mm -hmm. off. Uh, there was a, another guy, I remember he contacted me, his mother was a lesbian. And so he says that I really struggled with this for a lot of, a lot of years. And once I read your article, it made me understand my mother better. Right. Mm. So, 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 so there, you know, it's, it's not, again, it's, it's out of compassion. It's out of, and also out of concern that, that we lose our, our understanding of the human being, right? Because, mm. you know, listen, a, a man who, thinks he's a woman is now a woman, right? And vice versa. It's like, well, no, or or you can, or the pronouns he, she, and all these things don't mean anything anymore. At least they're attempting to try to make these things not have any meaning anymore. Entirely you know, optional, whatever you want to be. Yeah. Was yeah. that? I'm sorry. Sorry, or, or just make them entirely optional. You know, I, I just... Right. I decide if I'm he, she, or it, you know, but by by an act of will, but with any no recognition to to science or or the the, the bio, biology biology right. or the chromosomes or the physiology right. of the person concerned, which seems right. so it's a kind of very gnostic kind of understanding of human nature, which is very different from the Islamic Jewish Christian one, anyway. Yeah. Right, yeah, and this was interesting too. Coming back to the John Hopkins uh, study, you know, this is a, one of the things that they stated in there at the very beginning. They said that. That said, there's this distinction between sex and gender. There's no scientific basis for it. They actually say that literally, like that, that you know, that there's no scientific scientific basis for distinguishing between sex and gender, or that gender is something uh, unconnected to a biological sex. Right? Yeah. So, and and actually, there was a big outcry about this study, and they were trying to get it um, retracted. Wow. But, you know, but you know, they weren't successful. You know, because um, they're still selling it. You can still go buy it from. Uh, the uh, John John Hopkins uh, uh, website. You can buy the actual journal uh, entry, uh, that particular edition uh, of the journal. We call it the New Atlantis. Um, but I wonder if such research could even be undertaken today, let alone published in today's climate. Uh, in right. Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. You know, because that was 2016. Now it's 2021. About this going to 2022, and it seems that um, all of the the main. Um, uh, sources of of reality, <laughs> of mediated reality, have all c c colluded and 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 uh, concluded that uh, this is what people need to 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 conform to. Uh, and I see it. My my daughter, she's in high school. She has friends who actually have been bought into these ideas. Um, you know, I would say that what is good that there are many of the students who haven't, right, who still resist it, even here in California, right. There's some 
even in California. But that strikes me that a lot of people out there, even in California then, who are silently dissenting from this, uh, having to bite their tongues because they're not able to speak because of the sanctions against free speech on these issues. So it's not like silence may not mean that everyone agrees. It's just not everyone can speak out anymore. And it's a that's not a healthy thing for society being where where traditional views are suppressed. Uh, that's not mm -hmm. healthy at all. Can't be. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm um, so when you you're you're muddling with language, you're muddling with uh, the 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 assumptions about human nature. Mm -hmm. You are trying to redefine the human being. Um, uh, and then add on top of that, uh, the particular, um, I guess you would say the particular assumptions um, are connected with other assumptions, which clearly, which make it easy for many people to assume that there is a larger plan to promote anything that is in favor of population reduction. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, so conspiracy theorists or conspiracy factors, however you like to uh, 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 express it, you know, but uh, there's good reason to feel that way. Right. You know, that because um, the question is, why promote something that such a, an extreme minority of people actually are, you know, mm -hmm. struggling with. Right. Right. Why should try try to normalize that? You see, you know, yeah, it's the, the tail wagging the dog because you're right. The numbers of the actual numbers of people affected directly by these issues, yeah. whether it be homosexual oriented people or transgender, so on, are very tiny number of people, and yet th th that has become politicized and is opposed on the overwhelming majority of the population, which strikes me as an extraordinary thing mm -hmm. to have achieved. Uh, of a right. uh, tail wagging the dog, you know, uh, mm -hmm. remarkable um, achievement. Um, I wouldn't have thought it was right. possible, but it's, it's happened, obviously. Yeah, right, right, and then uh, we can even question the 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 claim that LGBTQ represents a community, right? When we actually know that there's a lot of diversity among those people. Mm -hmm. There are people who are gay, bisexual, lesbian who actually identify with the right. <laughs> yeah, they do right with the right. Uh, they there are uh, there are those who don't they don't like to be placed under the category of queer. They're gay and lesbian people. Who don't like that? So no, I'm not queer. I'm gay or I'm lesbian. And then you have uh, the 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 clash between gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgenders. You know, where it's just like, well, no, hold transgender, you don't belong here, right? Because our identities uh, or our orientations are built upon the sexual binary, right? You know, how can I be? How can I be gay if you understand if if the binary <laughs> it has no meaning, yeah. right? It, it's it's too messed up to even begin to think about it. It's just right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I just wanted to just, just to recommend um, some a uh, couple of books uh, mm -hmm. uh, that I've got. Uh, this one, "Sex Matters: mm -hmm. uh, Love, Marriage, and the Sunnah," a publication of MuslimMatters.org, mm -hmm. and there is a, a chapter in it which uh, I quite like um, by a guy called Brother Yusuf. Uh, entitled uh, From a Same-Sex Attracted Muslim, that's himself, mm -hmm. between denial of reality and distortion of religion. So he, he accepts Islamic teaching, of course, but he uh, he, he explores uh, what that means to him subjectively, personally, as a person who wrestles with these uh, issues. But uh, th th this book also encovers uh, heterosexual uh, marriage and uh, masturbation and uh, secret marriages and all sorts of things. Actually, really uh, qu quite a good little book. Um, on, from the Christian side, um, this little booklet really is called Same Sex Unions, the Key Biblical Texts. Now, this is a British publication. The author is Ian Paul, uh, the British minister, Church of England, although he is actually a, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in uh, in California, actually, as well. Um, but he's a, a, a conservative uh, Christian, a biblical scholar, and he looks at the Old Testament uh, texts and the New Testament uh texts about homosexuality, Paul, and so on, um, in the light of biblical scholarship. And uh, he comes to the conclusion that the traditional understanding of these texts certainly holds up, despite the revisionist attempts to pretend they don't say what people might not want them to say. And mm -hmm. um, and um, lastly, uh, this is a bit more hard line, this book, uh, but I still will recommend it. Um, Why Homosexuality is Prohibited in Islam. And the author is Abu Zainab Abd al-Rahman al-Kawim. 
Now, this book, uh, you can uh, download it on PDF. I did it earlier on mm -hmm. online, so you don't have to buy it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is um, certainly a very traditional understanding, but it's informed by the science and the, the scholarship and the, uh, the mm -hmm. academic issues. So that's um, yeah. uh, quite an erudite text as well. Do, uh, is there anything okay. that you would recommend for people to pursue these subjects further, apart from your Twitter, I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, again, this is... Um, uh, I mean, recently I haven't been posting much about this particular topic, you know, but as I stated before, that when I had written my original article that I don't recall any other articles being available, you know, so in that sense, um, it was somewhat of a pioneering um, piece. And, and, but I do want to just make one point about that that essay that I had written, is that there is a, there's a, a mistake in it that I still haven't updated, you know, and this relates to the story of the man who used to be in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad, oh, yeah. uh, his wives, right? You know, and I had mentioned in the actual essay that he was a pseudo hermaphrodite. Actually, that's an error. He was just simply an effeminate man, right? You know, even though later in the article, I do, I do, I have a, uh, I, I do talk about him being um, effeminate, right? You know, so it's, it's a somewhat of a contradiction in the actual essay, but that's something I haven't updated, you know. I've been meaning to do so, but just I haven't done it. You know, it just remains there. You know, so I want to be clear. But anyway, when it comes to, in terms of books, um, yeah. the Johns Hopkins study, like um, for instance, you have this. Uh, it's called is the special report on sexu sexuality and gender from 2016. Oh. Uh, okay. That's that's probably one uh, a probably good book. They have a book here by um, that uh, Mark Yarhouse. Um, this is. Uh, uh, homosexuality, the use of scientific research in the church, church's moral debate, right? That's an important book, I think, for anyone. Um, another one is um, Conundrum, the Evolution of Homosexuality by mm -hmm. N.J. Peters, which I believe, I believe actually is a, uh, is a feminist, as he's a woman, uh, writing. And, and so she talks about the issue of uh, sociobiology and, uh, you know, and, and the, and how, homosexuality to evolutionary biologists have been it, it, it much of a puzzle, a conundrum. Yes. Right? So yes. They feel that, okay, well, why has it continued to exist? Why does it continue to reemerge? You know, because if you believe in, um, um, you know, evolutionary biology, then it's the gene, if there's a gene, then it should have sort of right. ruled itself away, right? Yeah. You know, you know. It's not exactly helping the evolutionary process, is it? Yeah. Right. I mean, there's another one too called the puzzle, um, oh, exploring exploring the evolutionary puzzle of male homosexuality by Lewis Berman. That's a, it's a pretty thick book, you know. But is that, that's that a new one. That. Is that a new book or? Um, no, no. This is this is not new. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but let me see. No, I I'm, not a, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. That's very helpful. Uh huh. Yeah, I think it was written. It was written a long time ago, early 20th century, actually. 1935 uh, looks like it. 1935 actually. Written oh, by, yeah, yeah. By the puzzle, uh, and then one last one. I'll show you. This one is called uh, "Understanding Gender Dysphoria." Uh, this one is um, by Mark Yarhouse once again. Uh, you know, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so yeah, so th th there are many books you can you can uh, you can look at to uh, get a deeper understanding of this issue if you have an interest. Right? But um, those are the books that I um, rely on, like right now. Uh, uh, and when I wrote my article, I utilized a lot of uh, studies, uh, online mm -hmm. studies uh, from journals uh, to um, to build my argument there. And, and so fundamentally, I started and I talked about how the 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 how the Catholic catech catechism, it, mm -hmm. it states that uh, the um, psychological ideology of homosexuality is uh, mm -hmm. undetermined. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so and I said in the same way, the biological and physiological and similar uh, um, uh, bases is also undetermined. And that's really what I attempted to prove there. So that really in the moral realm, there's not any reason for Muslims to say that um, people are born gay or that a transgender person is who they believe they are. Mm. Um, and so there's no, no reason to sort of make any adjustments, right? At least morally, right? Um, now, in pra pragmatic terms, that's a different question altogether, right? So mm -hmm. how do you navigate it? How you navigate this issue politically and socially 
Um, and I generally would tell people, in particular, we started talking about the matter of the pronouns. Uh, like I tell my, my kids, well, my son's still not completely aware of these things. He's still nine years old. But my daughter, is, who's um, 17, um, I've always told her that when people come to you and start to say to you that you must utilize a particular pronoun to refer to them when they're not around or when you're talking about them, I, uh, you know, I, I suggest that you tell, tell them, know that you're not going to um, use a particular pronoun, but you just simply refer to them by their name. Right. So when you're talking about them, I'll just call you by your name. What's your name? What name do you prefer? Yeah, right? yeah. And that's as far as the, the compromise we can make there. Because right? anything else is uh, capitulation. Uh, yeah. It's um, corruption of language. It's corruption of community as well, because community is based upon having common nouns and common understandings and common words. Right. You know, it's, it's, so we become like the Tower of Babel. Right. When. We just, uh, you know, words mean only mean something to the speaker, right? And every time we speak to them, we can only understand what they mean once the speaker defines them to us, right? And mm -hmm. tells us, this is what I mean by this word. And so, and you have to use it in the way that I I use it. I say, well, no, mm -hmm. I don't have to, right? And mm -hmm. um, and if you have a name, I refer to you by your name, you know, and so that's as far as we, we can go. So um, that's the way that I generally deal with that that one issue yeah it's very thorny is there anything in conclusion we, we, we you've been uh, uh talking for as well, just over an hour now anything you'd like to in conclusion uh share with us uh, about this uh uh complex and vexed subject um yeah that um islam is opposed to any illicit intercourse right and it doesn't mean that all types of illicit intercourse are the same as stated before uh Fornication is wrong. Um, um, adultery is wrong, uh, but also um, sodomy and tributism are, are wrong as well. Um, what what we, creates a major challenge, you know, and perhaps even leads to uh, a lot of um, animus towards religious people, not just Muslims, but religious people in general. I think is that we live in a highly promiscuous, or we live in highly promiscuous societies, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and even religious people are very promiscuous, right? Well, people are associated with religious groups are very promiscuous. So, for a, a person who happens to be gay or or otherwise, um, may have very strong reason to feel, right, um, that you're being very hypocritical when you single them out and say, well, you're actually committing mm -hmm. sin too. Yeah, that's so true. why are you focused only on me? Right. Yeah. You know, um, because the habitation between a man and woman is perfectly accepted now. And yet that right. is a sin both in Catholicism and in Islam. It's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So, so, I, so, and again, that's not to belittle the severity of homosexual sex. Right. But, but it's simply just to make a point that, you know, that, um, that everyone has, um, everybody, everyone's redeemable. Everyone's mm -hmm. redeemable. Uh, so unless a Muslim in particular is trying to justify homosexual acts, then we should try our best to be patient with those individuals who come our way. Because right? often people are coming for help. They're looking for help. And if, you, if, you, if you're one who can help that person, then sure, go right ahead and try to direct them in the uh, right direction. You know? So. Uh, so, like this brother Yusuf, for instance, in the uh, from the the uh, article that you were highlighting from the book, uh, uh, Sex Matters, you know, individual among others who actually struggle with same sex attraction, but is not trying to validate or justify no. what uh, he uh, his his attraction. Right? You see, he's basically saying, okay, this is an issue. This is a fit enough for me. This is a test that I have. Right. And and I choose not to act on my urges. Right? So this is the other thing, too, is that because we live in such promiscuous societies, what has been suggested is that, well, other people are allowed to act on their urges. So why can I act on my urge? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Uh, so they're committing sin. And even if you consider your sin to be my sin to be worse than yours, you know, we're equal in that we're both committing sin. Right. But Islam says, well, no. You're supposed to be a master of yourself, right? You, you you're not supposed to allow your urges, your your appetites to rule you, to have mastery over you. You're supposed to have mastery over over your urges, and this is why when he 
the prophet talked about young people getting married, you know, young men, you know, Yama Shabab, you know, that all young men, you know, if you have the capacity, then marry. But if you're not able to marry, then fast, because fast acts as castration. In other words, a limited form of consecrated celibacy or um, uh, monasticism, I guess you would say, right? You know, so so you can, yes, you can restrain yourself, you can abstain, right? Uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's not much different from an individual, a man, he may be married and maybe he's contemplating adultery, right? You know, so um, should he act on his urge? No, he should restrain himself. You see, and, and remind himself, I, I have this at home already, right? You see, you know, that you, 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 all of us struggle with with things, you know, with our tongues, with our eyes, different parts of our bodies that we struggle with our urges, you know. And so um, fasting teaches us that that you can give up the things that you don't need, right? Because the fasting requires of you to give up the things that you need, right? Your food, drink, sexual gratification, right? And so you would successfully complete that every single year, 29 or 30 days every single year. And one of the lessons that I learned, particularly from fasting, is that if you can give up the things that your body needs, then you can give up the things that your body doesn't need, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so fasting itself is a way towards controlling our urges, you know. So you can't be a pious person if you don't have good control of your urges, right? Is that piety is has always or uh, appetites, emotions have always, and the control of those things have always had. A, a, an integral uh, place or role in determining whether or not a person is pious, right? Um, that the prophet said, if you control what is between your two jaws, between your two thighs, I will safeguard for you paradise, right? right? So, so, so you have to have control over yourself. The Quran is sort of that whoever fears standing before his Lord and restrains or prevents his snuffs himself from his lust, then paradise is his refuge. Paradise is his refuge, you know. So the Quran is constantly calling us to this, you know. So mind over matter, mind over matter, you know, that we that we don't allow the lower desires to rule us, that we utilize the higher appetite, the will should have the have mastery over the carnal appetites, right? So, 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 so any person who's struggling with any type of thing, uh, be it, again, drugs, be it porn addiction, be it, you know, again, homosexual urges, right? That we have the power, we have the strength to overcome that. And I would just, again, coming back to the, the uh, John, John Hopkins study, uh, making the point about how our sexuality is not as, as static hmm. sexual attraction is not as static for most people right as we generally think it is right so even yeah. to even classify yourself as heterosexual homosexual right that those of those particular classifications can be somewhat problematic because they're not scientific terms in hmm. that 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 you may again depending on the person right you know you might find certain men attractive that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to sleep with them you might find them attractive or a woman may find a woman attractive doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that they're going to sleep they want to sleep with them either yeah but 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 understand that this these terms are not scientific sexual attraction homosexuality heterosexuality are not really stable scientific terms that scientists themselves the scientific community actually rely heavily upon Right. You know, and so 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 in other words, what, what that means is that that uh, simply even if a person they actually they're actually suggesting that even if a person had a, a homosexual relationship in the past, that doesn't necessarily make you a homosexual now. Right. Yeah. Even if you still have those urges. Right. You just say, OK, well, you had a, a homosexual um, uh, experience. Right. Right. Uh, and, and, and vice versa. Right. It can it can be it can be, be the same. You know, so. Uh, of course, heterosexuality has a an, an advantage over homosexuality in that, from a naturalistic standpoint, you can, and biological standpoint, physiological standpoint, that you can argue that this itself, you know, God created the female body to complement the, the male body and vice versa, right? And that's why there's, you know, of course, lubrication and all these other things that, go, you know, and then also the access 
or creating a path towards procreation and prolonging the human species is there, right? So, uh, but um, yeah, so there's just quite, quite a bit here. And I do think that these are important points uh, for people to reflect upon. It's, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting one thing here, but, uh, you know, but, you know, we can perhaps leave it there. And we hope that um, this uh, video is, is beneficial and I hope that people uh, that it doesn't get censored as well, you know, because it's an important topic. Uh, it's a very sensitive issue that many people actually are struggling. They want to do better. Um, and I do think that Muslims have to be a bit more mature on this particular point. Um, and that doesn't mean that we need to uh, take a public, a public um, pastoral position. And what I mean by that is um, that it seems that the official position to take is one that favors um, um, psychology or psychological treatment of the of the individuals who struggle with these type of issues, with transgenderism or or self uh, or same sex um, attraction, um, gender confusion, confusion, you know, and such that we have to reinforce and affirm those people. I don't think that that's the right way to go, right? You know, in, in the public sphere. Right? Because most people are just not there. They, they, they're not, and then I don't think they're ever going to be there. Most people are ever really going to be there. You know, they might silence, self-censor themselves, silence themselves, right? You know, but they're never really going to be there. Whereas, you know, no, no, um, this is actually reality, right? This is science, right? Right. Rather, I think that we maintain the Islamic teachings publicly, you know. Uh, however, right, when we have people who approach us and they're having these struggles then we try to be a bit more compassionate and understand that all of us could be addicted or uh, struggle with our urges from time to time. And we might need that extra push, that extra help to, so that we can actually gain mastery over ourselves. Hmm. Well, that's, that's excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah Ali. And uh, I too obviously hope um, that this uh, uh, time together can be uh, uploaded onto YouTube without censorship. Um, and, um, yeah, it's horrible to even have to ask that question, actually. I think it's appalling. Um, but it's the reality uh, of the world we live in at the moment. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope, I'm sure people will find what you said to be a great benefit. And the very fact that we can even talk about it, assuming we can actually get this up, um, is, is, a, is a breakthrough. And we'll give people space to think outside of the prescribed boxes that we're told to think about these issues and, and to think perhaps more in terms of, what God may want of us rather than right. what um, the media may want of us. Right. Um, right. Cause there is a difference. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so um, thank you uh, very much and I'll leave it there. So until next time. All right. Thank you, Paul.